Thank you so much for joining us online today. We so appreciate you checking out this message. Uh, We hope you enjoy it and are inspired to live more and more like Jesus Christ by His grace. If you would like to support the ministries of Rancho, you can do so at rancho.tv slash giving. Set up a giving profile and a reoccurring gift. We'd sure appreciate that. Enjoy. All right. Well, we can Uh, just chit-chat for an hour. (laughs) Let's talk about about being old. Truly... I think the most important week of this summer. We're talking about what Jesus reimagined. He reimagined humanity. He reimagined uh, priorities. He reimagined purpose. Last week we talked about Jesus reimagining community. Mm. So Jesus comes on the scene 2,000 years ago and he basically looks at the landscape of the world and says, you know, you got a lot that could be kind of cleaned up here. A lot needs to be reimagined. What we're talking about this week is Jesus reimagining God. And that's a big statement. Even the statement, I, as I wrote it in the computer, I felt uncomfortable. <laughs> like, right. What do you mean reimagine God? Yeah. Does he need to be reimagined? And what Jesus says is kind of yeah, because he looked at how people perceived God, and he says, not only do you have a lot of that wrong, but you're creating so much damage because you do not perceive God in a right way. And, and so, you know, Steve, we're going to talk about the importance of what it means to, to believe in God in a way that's constructive and not destructive. Why is it so important Hmm. who we believe God is? Well, I mean, interesting, when you talk about all the things he's reimagined, I think that in that culture, especially the religious leaders, it was the way they imagined God that impacted all the other things he's getting them to reimagine. So I think it's important because every single one of us are affected more about our belief in God than we think. It, you know, we can get into, we'll get into some science ideas, neurological ideas. I mean, they're finding more and more how true that is. And so the Bible talks about the mind, what we set our minds on, how we think, a renewing of our minds over and over and over again. And when he's talking about renewing your mind to people that have been religious for hundreds and 1,500 years, this is a huge deal. So, so I think it's important because it has an effect on us more than we might think. Right. And so... I think the last year in our culture has shown that. I think yeah. things we see throughout the world shows that our view of God matters. I mean, A.W. Well, yeah. Tozer wrote that. I think you had that quote. I that. do. So here's a quote from A.W. Tozer. He says this, what comes in our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Hmm. And I read that. I had to rewrite, re- reread that, not just assume it's true. But as you think kind of down that line of what we believe about God and all that falls out of that, yeah. it's, it touches everything. It does. What we believe about God impacts our worldview. So what we believe about God shapes how we see everything. Hmm. It shapes who we think we are, who we are in our household, who we are in the world. It also shapes civilization. So if you, uh, and I did a little bit of this, I I didn't have a lot of time, but if you look at cultures all over the world, what they believe about God often matches who they are as a culture. So if a certain culture believes God, let's say, is um, vengeful and violent, that culture is probably going to have some violent tendencies. Right. And you don't have to look very far to find violent tendencies no. in terms of culture and religion. If, if a culture's perception of God is communal, so, you know, God is about all of us, then that culture is going to be communal. Uh, here in the West, we perceive uh, God as being very focused on the individual. Mm. And so the United States culture is very individualistic, and so God is very individualistic. So we talked about a personal relationship with God. So what we perceive of God impacts everything in terms of who we are, who we think we are, and it impacts culture itself. Nothing is untouched by what we perceive about God. No. I mean, I, mean, I was just thinking, I mean, how many of you like had a certain type of father and you said, I'm never going to be like that? And then what do you do? You become like that, right? You become, I mean, I, I have those traits come out of my dad. I will never say that to my kid, <laughs> that I'm saying the same thing, right? And so that just shows like how that hands down. When you say individual, I've heard one guy say that the Christian church, especially in America, is one of the most narcissistic, where narcissists can come to hide and thrive. I got a personal relationship with God. I'm going to heaven. I'm getting a mansion. I'm one of God, right? right. I, I, me, me. And, And that becomes it. I'm blessed by God. Look at all that we have. I mean, we are so blessed to live in America. And Southern California in America, are you kidding me? The epitome of blessing. And we tie that all together with a certain view of God. He blesses, we're the faithful. Oh, those people must be cursed because of the lifestyle, the situations they live in. And you see it all over the world. Yeah, it is is a huge, huge reality. So 
So Jesus has the audacity 2,000 years ago to show up to a culture that has, like you said, 1,500 years of entrenched mm. thinking about God. And, and so the, the Jewish culture was founded on, on the law, right? Uh, you have those books of the Bible right there in, in, your, in, your, in your scripture. Uh, the first five books of the Bible are the books of the law, the Pentateuch. Their entire civilization is based on that. And so their perception, understandably, was here's the law. You obey the law, you're good with God. You disobey the law, you're not. You obey the law, you're blessed by God. You disobey the law, you're not. That's their entire framework. And, 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 and they translated that not just into who they are as a people, but in their own standing with God, they perceived him as a judge. They perceived him as vengeful. They perceived him as just issuing edicts. Either the edict that you're guilty, you broke the law, here's a curse. You're guilty, you broke the law, here's condemnation. Or you obeyed the law, here's blessing. You obeyed the law, here's prosperity. So 1,500 years of this culture perceiving God as judge, Jesus comes along and says, I don't think you have that right. God is, in fact, not a vengeful judge to you. He's a gracious father to you. And their brains could not take it because you're talking about 1,500 years of their entire civilization, generation upon generation, founded on this mental paradigm of who God is. And Jesus says, you got it wrong. God's actually not a judge. He's a father. And you read the life and ministry of Jesus as he's trying to reimagine God. It went well for a little while, and then it went south big time. Yeah. He was rejected by his own hometown, rejected by the religious leaders, rejected by the political leaders because he was trying to change their mind about God, which is very difficult. Why is it so difficult to change our <laughs> mind about God? Uh, yeah, it's hard to change my mind about anything. <laughs> True. You know, I mean, it's like I've, I've been reading this book and kind of reading up on this a little bit on the idea that you can't change your belief by, a, by an exertion of will. Yeah. Like I can't just determine to see something different today. And so I think in this area of God, we are so entrenched ever since we're little. I mean, how many of you, if you went to someone at your work and they've never been to church before and you said, what do you think you'd have to change if you started going to church? And I bet you they'd have a list. Yeah. I got to stop smoking, can't cuss, can't go to those kind of movies. Right, right, right. I have a list. I've never even been to church, and I know because we have this culture that we've been raised in. So it is hard to change our minds. And then we also have that fear side of it. You know, we have that idea that God not only is judging. Like for me, I, I was like a goody two-shoes kid, okay? I didn't want to get in trouble. That was pretty easy for me. It wasn't like a deal. But I, my mind was always going. So the idea of God being this judge, I was always felt threatened because of my upbringing. It's like, you believe this or God might right. reject you. Man, for me, as I've been on this journey of thought, this journey of belief and having beliefs shifting or whatever, it is hard. And you feel like you're, you're doing something wrong, you know, by being honest. Really, right. it's being honest. Right. It starts off by being honest, mm -hmm. and it is not easy. It's not easy in a lot of things to change. I work with couples just trying to see someone's side differently, changing what you believe, changing your paradigm, I think is one of the hardest things to do. For sure, especially if you believe God is judge. If you believe God is judge, and then your brain starts saying and thinking, I'm not sure that's right, and you start shifting to this new paradigm that Jesus teaches that God is now a loving father. Right. Not only is it hard to change your mind about who God is, but you're changing your mind away from the thinking that God is judged. So now if you move away from that, he's probably going to get you. Oh, he's going to judge you now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Whew, it's a vicious cycle. It is a vicious cycle. But here's, here's a great verse in 1 John 3, 1. Now get this. This establishes what Jesus came to reimagine about God, that God is a father. We are his children. See how very much our father loves us. You can almost hear John, who was a disciple of Jesus. He knew Jesus. He's pleading, would you see how much the Father loves us? Because what we see in our natural state, what we see in our religious state, is that God judges us. John is saying, see something different. Believe something different. Believe how much he loves you. For he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Mm -hmm. So see something different and recognize something different. But it is so incredibly difficult. When we're raised with the paradigm that God has judged, changing your belief, you can't just, like you said, will yourself to, oh, now it's something different. Now I'm going to totally relate with God in an entirely different way because Stephen Scott said so. It doesn't you know, work yeah. like that. And, and when you think about it, when he talks about those that don't know me, who did Jesus go after? Who did Jesus say those were? Those are the religious leaders. Yeah. 
I mean, it was the religious leaders that often he would say, he was saying to them, you have it wrong. And you are trying to, you're, I mean, you're making people twice the children of the devil that you are because you're giving them this fear-based, judgment-based idea of God. And it's just, it's just very interesting when you start really looking at the Bible and really realizing that what Jesus was going after when he says comments like that, because they didn't know. I mean, the people that we would say didn't know, they're the ones flocking to him. They're flocking to this message. They're coming, never feeling worthy to come. Now they are. Why those are standing in the back going like, who's this guy think he is? We're gonna kill him because he's preaching this idea that you're blessed and you're blessed and you're blessed and you're loved and you're loved. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a really uh, uh, just powerful reality, you know. So you mentioned a good point that it's the religious leaders who tried and, and did stop Jesus and killed him because he was taking away their power. Yeah. The power of the religious leaders is fear. God wants you to believe this. I'm telling you to believe it. That's the power of the religious leader. God says, this is how you should live. I'm telling you, this is how you should live. That's the power of the religious leaders. So it's the religious leaders who put Jesus to death. It was the people who were being judged by religious leaders yeah. that flocked to God as father. They were able to kind of change their minds. As Steve and I talked about earlier, when we are uh, in our formative years, and I'm talking about from the time we're kids all the way through the time we're, we're uh, in our young 20s, right? These are the formative years that really shape what we believe about God. So these are the years where our brains are, are mush. I mean, literally soft brains congealing till about our mid-20s. During those formative years, we hear a lot of things about God. We hear things about God from our parents. We hear things about God from Sunday school teachers. We hear things about God from uh, youth pastors. We hear things about God from sermons. And they're just planted, like trees planted in our brains. And we hear these things from people that we trust, people that we know love us. We know they care for us. They know they have our best interests at heart, but they've got this forest in their heads and their brains about what they believe about God because people planted that in their minds when they were young. And so generation after generation, we're told what to believe about God. And typically, he is judge. He is vengeful. Now, there's a lot I was taught in my formative years and I got a little list, and it's a list of normal things kids are taught about God. It's a normal list. There's nothing strange about this list. It's, it's normal, but as we read this, you might have had the same experience. You might have been taught the same thing, or if you weren't explicitly taught the same thing about God, you probably assumed this about God. But as I read this list of the things I was taught from well-meaning, loving people, who really did pour their life and invested their life in me because they wanted me to be right and they wanted me to be good and they wanted me to be, quote, saved. These are the things that were poured into my brain as a young man that shaped who I thought God was. I was told God demands death for my sin. I was told this when I was that big, that I was so bad, God demanded death for my sin. I was told God demands shedding of blood for my sin. So not just death, but bloodshed. Almost like God is bloodthirsty. He is so offended by my sin and our sin. Somebody's blood must be spilled. I was taught that. I was told Jesus was killed because I deserve to be killed because of my sin. That's a big weight to carry when you're that big. I was told God will come back to destroy all believers with fire. I was told God will condemn unbelievers to eternal bodily torture. I was told God will only hear my prayer if I first confess my sin and repent of my sin. So there's a separation from God because I do things that are wrong. In order for me to earn my way to God, I have to confess my sin. And I remember when I was young trying to remember every sin I committed. Sometimes it was a long dang list and sometimes I knew I missed something. And so I thought, well, if I didn't confess that sin, if I didn't repent or turn from that sin, then I won't be close to God. Maybe he won't hear my prayer. I was told if I keep on sinning, I could lose my salvation and be eternally condemned. I was told in junior high, if I wanted God to bless my life, I have to pray regularly, read the Bible regularly, obey his commandments, go to church regularly, give money, volunteer, and share my faith with others. That was the pathway to have God bless my life. I was told that my sins separated me from God. So every time I did something wrong, every time I disobeyed you know, God's word, there would be a separation. He would turn his back on me. 
and I had to get my way back. I was told that in order to be saved from eternal torment, I had to believe the right doctrines about God. It was about being right. You know, what must you believe in order to be saved? And sometimes that list got very long and no two lists ever matched. I was told that God would punish me if I sinned by making sure things did not go well for me. I was told that God was a judge by well-intended and good people. Do any of these things sound familiar to you? This is truly the normal Christian life in church. Now, this was probably a little more true in the 80s and the 90s when I was, uh, you know, a youngin'. Uh, perhaps there's a little bit more grace and perhaps there's a little less focus on the tough stuff, but I'm telling you, not much. I'm out there a lot. I see a lot. So even though the younger generations may not have quite the dose of this that I had, the churches today are led by people who were raised in this. So the church very much still has this as the kind of steady drumbeat, right? We talk about grace. We talk about love. We might sing about grace. We might sing about love. But when this is your underpinning, that God is a judge and God demands you to believe the right things and he demands you to live the right way in order to please the judge so that he'll bless your life instead of condemn you. When there's that underlying sort of culture of fear, all the talk about love and grace, it doesn't connect. When the paradigm is that God is judge. This was a, uh, a picture, an image, an illustration, very popular in the 80s, right? Some of you might have seen it, maybe even in the 90s. This was the image of God. This big, giant, white, brooding judge, and he was going to point which direction you went, to his left, to his right, heaven or hell. And by the way, what other uh, illustrations uh, also um, uh, put out there was that there's a screen next to this big judge and everything you've ever done in your life is going to be put on that screen for everyone to see. And we will be judged for every single thing we've done. That's the image. That's the image. And so when we sing songs like, I got to know you as a father, know you as a friend, this just doesn't compute. It really is one or the other. It's one or the other. And Jesus says, I'm going to ask you to change what you believe about God. I'm going to ask you to change what you perceive about him, that he is no longer a judge. Get that out of your brain. He's no longer a vengeful judge. He's a loving father. Jesus walked us through this process. Jesus actually came to reimagine God himself. Very bold. Jesus came to free us from believing God is a vengeful judge and free us to believe that God is a loving father. And he used the word father, the Greek word father, pateer, pateer. Um, that, uh, that word Jesus uses at least 200 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to describe God. He's always talking about God as father over 200 times. How often did Jesus talk about God as judge? 17. 11 of those times is when he said God is not a judge or that it's wrong to judge. Only three times did Jesus say, yes, I am actually judge. And all three times Jesus says, I'm actually judge. He isn't judging somebody for breaking the law. You get what I'm saying here? Jesus is so committed to ripping out of our brains this idea that God is a vengeful judge. The only three times he says that he is judge is when he's not judging somebody for breaking the law and saying, I have the last word on it. End of that discussion. But I'm telling you, the journey from believing God as judge to believing God as a loving father is so difficult. It's so difficult. It is actually called in sort of church circles and theological circles, a deconstruction of our faith. You can't just hear one sermon and say, okay, well, you know, Scott and Steve said, don't perceive God as judge, perceive him as father. Okay, I'm good. Next. Doesn't happen like that. It is brutally difficult. For me, I was about 23 years old. I was going through a little bit of a faith crisis. I had been a youth pastor for two years, and I'm, I'm delivering messages to kids that I'm not believing anymore, messages that threaten them, messages that talk about how sinful they are and how separate from God they are, and, and this judge that is going to condemn them unless they believe these things about God and unless they behave this way. This is what I was taught. This is what I was pouring into the next generation. Threats and fear and judgment. 
And I'm not believing this anymore. And I'm looking at the life of Jesus and I'm saying, this is not computing, right? This whole religious paradigm that God has judged is not what Jesus is teaching. It is not how Jesus is living. In fact, as I started just obsessing on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Just obsessing on Jesus and thinking to myself, if I just focus on Jesus, everything's going to be clear. And it was. The religious paradigms start to become unrooted in the brain. These thousands of trees that were planted in my formative years about who God was, God is judge, were starting to be un unrooted because I was focusing on Jesus, the life, the ministry of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus. And I see him unrooting this forest of trees out of my brain that said God is judge, and he starts planting these little seeds. No, God is Father. God is Father. God is Father. And it's tough. It's especially tough if your own father has got some challenges as well. That's a whole other layer, right? But what if we perceived God as a perfect, loving father? What if we reimagined God the way Jesus asked us to reimagine God? And here's how Jesus did it. One of the ways anyway. He's telling stories, he's teaching, preaching about God the Father, but the story that he told that I think had the most impact then, 2,000 years ago, and continues to have the most impact now, is the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son, the wayward son. It's all about how you perceive God. Here's the story, short version, most of you know it. Father had two sons. The younger son said, Dad, I'm out of here. I want half of your estate, half of your estate, that is rightfully mine. I want it all now. Not going to wait till you're dead. I want it all now, and I'm going to leave this country. I'm leaving this family. He takes all this wealth, and he blows it in a distant country on gambling and prostitutes. He ends up destitute. He has nothing. He's just serving pigs on a farm. And, and he has this reality. He says, you know what? I could come back home. My father will judge me, but maybe he will give me the the honor of just being a slave, just a servant on the farm. So he goes home. He has no choice. Here's what actually happened. The prodigal, the wayward son, returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. The youngest son was expecting a judge. The youngest son knew his his failures. He knew his faults. He knew his sin. He brought shame upon this family. And, and he knew all he deserved was to maybe just be as a slave, a servant on the farm, feeding pigs in his father's house. So he thought he was going to see a judge. When he went over that horizon and saw his home, he expected a judge to come out and condemn him, but maybe give him some mercy to serve uh, on the farm as a slave. The father instead runs to his son, embraces his son, and kisses his son. This wayward son expected a judge. What did he get? A perfectly loving father. But he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. So as the father is trying to embrace his wayward son, you're just still probably smelly from the slop of the, you know, the pig feed, dealing with all the shame and the consequences of his, of his failed past. As dad is trying to embrace his son and kiss his son, he's like, you can almost kind of see him swatting the hands away and saying, no, I deserve to be judged. And that's how a lot of people perceive their relationship with God is I, I'm not the good boy. I'm not the good girl. I'm not obeying God all the time. There's things in my life that I am doing that I know I shouldn't do and I know I should be doing stuff that I'm not doing I should be a better person, and so God, I, I, I don't have any right to be near you. A lot of the reason why people don't come to church is because they think, I haven't earned it. A lot of reasons why people pray is, I'm not good enough for God. He's not going to pay attention to me. I, I know who I am. I know my thought life. I know what I've done. We're oftentimes like this younger son. I've just sinned against heaven and earth, and I don't deserve anything. But the father said, this son of mine was lost, but now he is found. So let the party begin. I love that. The father says to his wayward son, I'm not your judge. I'm your dad. Come here. He goes, no, I don't deserve it. I'm your dad. Come here. Let's party. He gets the family robe and the family ring and bring out the best cow to munch on and let's go for it. 
Let's party. Who had the problem? The older son had the problem who did everything right. The older son was in line. The older son was the religious one following the rule book. And the older son looked at the younger son and said, what do you mean? Send the judge. The rule book, the Old Testament said that son should have been killed. When you disrespect your parents like that, the law, the old covenant says, take him outside the city and throw rocks at his head until he's dead. That's what the law said. So the eldest son is saying, kill the boy. When Jesus was telling this story, I guarantee you, everyone in the crowd who was hearing the story was saying, kill the boy. Judge the boy. And so when Jesus gives the moment that only Jesus can give and says, actually, the father embraced and kissed his son and they threw a party, you can just kind of imagine all the crowd going, what, are you kidding me? This is insane. This guy deserves to be put to death according to the rule book, the religious rule book. Jesus was reimagining God. He was reimagining God. Then Jesus does one other thing. He introduces a word in front of the word patier. Patier is the Greek word for father. It's a more formal word, the source, the head. He puts a word in front of that, Abba. Abba. Abba is an Aramaic word, and it means dad. It's a much, much less formal word. It's a very common word. You just say hey, dad, not father, but dad. And Jesus starts using the phrase Abba patier, Abba, Father, Dad. That's all. You talk about reimagining God. It's hard enough saying, okay, change your mind, change your belief from believing God is judge to believing God is Father. Okay, I can maybe, maybe, but Dad, are you serious? I can be that informal with God? Dad? Yeah. Absolutely. That's what Jesus is reimagining. In fact, in Jesus most difficult time. He's just about to face the cross. He uses this phrase, Abba Patir, Abba Father, he cried out. He says, everything is possible. Please take this cup of suffering away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Here's this amazing, intimate moment between Patir, God, and Jesus. And Jesus says, Abba Patir, Abba Father, Dad, I'm suffering here. And, and Dad, God, is with Jesus, walking with him in his suffering, walking with him through his suffering. Because the cause of Christ cost Jesus his life. The cause of Christ begins with reimagining who God is. Because I'm telling you, this entire world is trapped in the idea that God is judge. I mean, just go down for kicks. Go down every religion on earth. Go down every single one of them. There's a couple hundred of them. Go down every single religion on earth. And I guarantee you, I've done it. Every single religion, including the Christian religion, teaches God as judge. Everyone. Even though 2,000 years ago, Jesus tried to rip that forest from our brain and plant the seed that God is, in fact, a loving father. I was talking to my, my wife after last service, and she says, how is it that 2,000 years later we're still having this discussion, All right? You think after 2,000 years we wouldn't go back to this old way, but it's all right here. It's our human nature. Our human nature knows God is perfect. Our human nature knows we are not, so our human nature thinks there must be a separation. We must be under condemnation. We think that before we get involved in any religion at all. Then we get into a religion and we hear it all affirmed again. Yes, God is judge. Yes, he is perfect. You're not and you need to do better. The road from believing God is judge to believing God is father, especially Abba Father, is so difficult. So difficult. It's so difficult that many people simply can't be a part of this conversation. They just can't. Their, their heads can't take it. Their brain is in such a rut, this forest in their head that cannot be unplanted. I understand it. I totally understand it. Number one reason why people leave this church is because of this message. The number one pe reason why people come to this church is because of this message. Because they're ready to walk a journey away from God as judge towards God as father. And Jesus proved that and Jesus settled it on the cross. 
If you have your communion cups, we're going to take communion together. This communion, the bread and the juice, this is the symbol of embracing and accepting and believing God as Father. Because when Jesus was in that upper room, they were there uh, celebrating a tradition of the Old Covenant. As you take that bread out, it was the unleavened bread of the Passover, the meal that the Jews had celebrated for 1,400 straight years. It was a meal that celebrated God rescuing the Jews out of slavery and setting them free. But Jesus reimagined God and says, this is not about celebrating freedom from Egypt. This is about remembering me. So he says, from now on, as I, as I reimagine God, from now on, when you take this bread, understand this broken bread represents my body broken for you. That is how much I love you. That is how committed Jesus was to making sure we understand that God is Father. All the religious leaders and power brokers had to put him to death. They could not accept it. So take this bread and eat it in remembrance of the love that Christ has for you. Then Jesus took the wine of the Passover meal and he says, this is no longer to celebrate the, the meal that you had in Egypt the night before you were set free. This is to remember me, my blood which is shed for you. This is how much I love you. This is how much I am committed to making sure you reimagine God from a judge to a father. It's cost Jesus his life. This message cost Jesus his life. So take this as a symbol of receiving the love that God has for you and remember Jesus. I'm going to pray a prayer of simple faith and then we're going to sing one more song together that puts a bow on this. And it's going to be this wonderful way to close this out in, in one of two ways. If this message radically offended you, I sincerely apologize. <laughs> I don't regret it, not a word of it. But what I want you to do is, is to try the best you can to not resist this. Maybe this message, particularly those of you online, maybe this message can be the very first step in you walking a journey from God as judge to God as father and you will experience freedom and joy and fun in your walk with God like you can't even imagine, but it starts by some very uncomfortable truths that maybe all that has been poured into you or a lot of what's been poured into you, especially in your younger years, may not be true. That's hard. Walk that journey. For others of you, you are begging for this message. You are so excited and there are smiles on your face and like, this is it and I am home and this is the message and I am free. And I get to enjoy now walking with God as heavenly father. Accept this and receive this through prayer. God, we thank you for our time together. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you are not a vengeful judge looking to punish us for every mistake uh, needing us to be right and needing us to be good in order for you to approve of us. You are not our judge. Jesus made it very clear. He also made it clear you are our father, Abba uh, Patre, Patre, Abba Father. We receive you as our father, a perfect father, perfectly loving, perfectly gracious, perfectly forgiving in every way. Thank you that you embrace us even with our failures as, as the wayward son was embraced you embrace us. We want to know that embrace and even feel that embrace and know that you look at us in the eye and you say, I love you. You are forgiven. You are perfect in my eyes. I embrace you. Now let the party begin. May we know that. May we feel that and live into the pleasure of that. And God, for everyone here who might be struggling, the struggle is, is, is very real. It, it is very tense at times. It is long-term Going from perceiving you as judge to perceiving you as father seems somehow um, impossible at times. But God, would you walk everyone through their journey, through the struggle, from the slavery of the way we used to think into the freedom of embracing you as father. In Christ's name we pray.